Well, hello there, and welcome back to Soteriology. In today's class, we're going to be transitioning from Augustine, who set the standard model for an understanding of soteriology, who lives in around the year 400, and toward the Middle Ages and Aquinas, nominalism, and later on Reformation thought. It's a large chronological gap to bridge between 400 and 1200, when Aquinas will take stage. And so today we're going to look at one important development that leads us from the time of Augustine up to the time of Aquinas. And that is the development of the sacramental system as a whole and the importance theologically for understanding sacraments as the instrumental means of salvation. How salvation is worked out in the church through God's grace as sacraments are that means of grace where we receive grace and are able to live out the Christian life. Now remember that for Augustine, justification is a process. It's the process of God making us right. And that process begins with prevenient grace. Now, Augustine is absolutely clear on this against Pelagius. God accomplishes prevenient grace in us. It's not something that we do. We have nothing that would turn our will toward God by ourselves. God gives us prevenient grace. That grace is irresistible. It turns us toward God. And then we receive the gift of faith. Now, faith is an intellectual apprehension of God's promise, God's goodness, and God's reality. But faith is incomplete in itself. For Augustine, following scripture here, it's always faith working through love, as St. Paul puts it. And so, faith working through love stirs up in my heart a delight for God. It makes actions that I do good in the sight of God because it elevates me beyond my nature into the life of God as I do those actions and starts me on this path of living out the Christian life. In that life, we need persevering grace, that continual grace that comes from God and gives us the ability to persevere in the Christian life. Grace is operative and cooperative here because it operates, God is the initiator of it, and we cooperate. We work alongside grace, working out our salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who's working in us to will and to work according to his good pleasure. That then produces merit. Now merit, Augustine is absolutely clear, is nothing other than God's good works, which he's produced in us, which he then crowns by making them salvific. So God enables good works in us, God produces those good works in us, and those works he rewards with salvation. What happens between the year 400 and the year 1200 is that the sacramental system becomes more developed. And as we understand that sacramental system, we'll see how it maps onto Augustine's model, and therefore how we're able to see the sacraments operating as the process, the instrumental means by which this salvation occurs in the life of the believer. So what exactly are sacraments? Well, let me start with this definition by the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and we'll seek to explain what sacraments are and how they work in the life of believers as a result of this definition. So, sacraments are efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the Church by which divine life is dispensed to us. The visible rites by which the sacraments are celebrated signify and make present the graces proper to each sacrament. They bear fruit in those who receive them with the required dispositions. So let me give a little bit of a background and I'll come back to this definition and explain it phrase by phrase. The understanding is that Christ instituted these sacraments and that all grace that is present in these sacraments comes from Christ himself. So it is the working out of Christ's perfect life that gives merit for this sacramental grace and then grace comes to us by means of these sacraments. This is the channel that God has chosen to work in our lives. And so grace comes from putting ourselves in the place to receive his grace in the sacraments. 
This is absolutely not salvation by works. Far from it. We have to go there and receive grace from God. These are God's chosen means by which we receive grace. And so it's not of works. It's a reception of grace into our lives so that we're empowered for loving God and then our actions flow out of that love for him. These have been given to the church because it's the church that mediates salvation. The church holds the content of faith and the church lives the life of faith. And so it's for the church then to mediate the process of salvation to those faithful who are part of the church. Now, sacraments then can only be administered for the most part by those who are ordained. There's exceptions here, but we're just painting in broad strokes. Sacraments follow life stages. So when you think about it, there's the sacrament of baptism, done with infants, bringing them into the sphere of God's grace. It mirrors that life stage of being born and entering into life. And then to complete that sacrament, there's the sacrament of confirmation. When one is a teenager, perhaps, one confesses the faith, one makes the faith their own. And that's absolutely necessary because infant baptism started something that has to be completed. God's grace may begin to work out in a person's life, but that person has to then acknowledge and themselves take ownership of their faith. And that's what happens in confirmation. And then a group person grows a little bit older and must make a decision on a life pursuit. Now here, marriage and holy orders are the two options. Certainly some can have both at the same time. In the Eastern Church, for example, one can be married and a minister. Uh, but in the Western Church, from about the 11th century onwards, it became a matter of canon law that we had to choose between the two. Um, that is still an issue of canon law. It's not necessary, but one usually makes a life choice between a religious life, where one is ordained to a particular service in ministry, or a life of marriage. These are different lives, and they're blessed by sacramental realities at the point that one chooses that form. At the end of one's life, then, comes the anointing of the sick, and this can happen at several times in a person's life. Whenever one is sick, it's directly from James, uh, anointing them with oil for their healing. And at the end of a person's life, that anointing of the sick is done to prepare that person to move into the immediate presence of God in order to uh, complete that person's life and give grace for that final stage, which is dying. Now, there are two maintenance sacraments or continuation sacraments, we might say. One is Eucharist, and that's the center of the life of the church because it's the presence of Christ mediated to us. We receive his presence into our lives and we're changed by him. And that's an ongoing sacrament. Then it's done every week and one could celebrate it every day, perhaps. And then there's the sacrament of reconciliation. If I'm in mortal sin, if I fall away from the church, then I need to be restored to my life of faith. And so the process of reconciliation is that of contrition. I feel anguish for my sin. Then I go and confess it, and I'm brought back officially into the sphere of faith. And so I'm brought back into harmony and union with the church, and my Christian life then can continue. Now, let's go back to that definition. The sacraments are efficacious signs of grace. That means they affect something. Let's see what that means. Look at this bottom quote. The sacraments are efficacious. That means that they actually work. Only because Christ himself is at work. So these are the means by which Christ is present and active to his members. So it's he, Christ, who baptizes, he who acts in his sacraments in order to communicate the grace that each sacrament signifies. So it's only because Christ is present here doing this work, giving grace himself, that these sacraments operate in such a way that they bring about union with Christ. They're instituted by Christ, then that will be key that Christ himself set these up, and they're entrusted to the church, so the church then mediates them out, and by which divine life is dispensed to us. They're the means by which Christ is 
living and active in our lives. The visible rites by which the sacraments are celebrated both signify and make present the graces proper to each sacrament. We'll talk about how that works in just a moment. And the last phrase is key. They bear fruit in those who receive them with the required dispositions. One has to be properly disposed of the sacraments, one has to receive them in faith. Let's say a bit more about that little phrase, they signify and make present what they signify. The church has been quite clear on this. The sacraments work ex opere operato. And that means by the very fact of the action being performed, by the very fact that they are operating, they're doing something. Now, let's make sure that we understand this properly. They're not magical. This is not a mechanistic kind of a thing. In fact, the only reason that they work is because they're the chosen means by which Christ comes to us. So, it's in virtue of the saving work of Christ accomplished once for all. The sacraments have power because Christ accomplished his saving work for us. And this, this is the means by which Christ then is present to us to instill that saving work in our lives. It follows that the sacrament is not wrought by the righteousness either of the celebrant or of the recipient but by the power of God. What they're getting at is that the faith of the minister doesn't make the sacrament work. And it's not just because a person comes to it with really, really great faith that the sacrament works. Rather, God has already chosen that these are the means by which his grace will be communicated. This, there's a long tradition here that goes back to what's called the Donatist controversy, where Christians were worried about, well, what happens if the person who baptized me leaves the faith? Does that mean that one's baptism is nullified if, one, if the one who does it leaves the faith? No, says the church. That sacrament is effective because God has said it's effective. And so it's not wrought by the righteousness of the celebrant, the minister, or the recipient, the individual, but by the power of God. For the moment that a sacrament is celebrated in accordance with the intention of the church, the power of Christ and his spirit acts in and through it, independent of the personal holiness of the minister. Even if the minister leaves his faith another week or so after the baptism was performed, that baptism is still valid because God worked in that baptism. Nevertheless, the fruits of the sacrament, and this is so important, also depend on the disposition of the one who receives them. So think of it like a water faucet. Now the water faucet has been hooked up to the source, so it will produce water if you turn the handle. And that's what the church is getting at here. These sacraments are effective if done, but notice that still could do no good for the recipient if the recipient doesn't come in faith. One could bring a very, very small container and therefore wouldn't be able to get enough water even to have a drink. A person with very little faith may not receive anything much from the sacrament. It may be so small it's of very little value because they came with very little faith. A person could approach the water faucet with absolutely no container and therefore get absolutely no water for themselves. In the same way, a person could come to baptism, say, or any of the other sacraments with no faith, and therefore there would be no grace given to that individual. So the point of the sacraments working ex per operato is that God has chosen them as means, but the individual may nullify their effectiveness by not coming in faith. Now, one other thing we need to talk about here, the sacrament is a sacred sign that actually affects what it signifies. That ring, when put on a person at the right time, really does affect something. If it goes along with an I do, it really does affect that person being married. And so it's a sign, but it really does affect what it signifies. And that's the way that the church wants us to think about sacraments, that they actually do give grace and create a certain standing before God. The symbol does affect something in the right circumstances. And that's the idea with the sacraments. Now that we've seen the seven sacraments and how they attach to different life stages and the process of the ongoing Christian life, 
Let's go back to Augustine's model and see how theologians attach sacramental significance to the different parts of salvation. Once theologians were attaching grace to this sacrament of baptism and emphasizing that infant baptism was the right process because the young children need to be brought into the sphere of the church, it became very easy to associate baptism with that first step of provenient grace. Because, of course, a child doesn't know about the grace that's going on inside of them. And so God is doing something in them that they have no idea about. Now, this is very similar to the way that provenient grace works. Because Augustine has emphasized that God's grace must work first before the individual is even capable of receiving the grace of God to turn that person's will so that a person will be receptive to the grace of God. So provenient grace then turns the will, opens the will toward God, and does something before the individual has the ability to act out of free will toward God. So baptism became an excellent sign of how God's provenient grace works even before the individual is able to consciously receive it. So it's naturally associated there with provenient grace. Now, remember also with Augustine that, well, one could have provenient grace, but then the individual has to persevere in that grace. So they have to continue in the life of grace, and they could lose it. And here then, with persevering grace, it seemed especially appropriate to attach the sacrament of penance, theologically. Because in penance, what one is doing is recognizing that I've sinned and I've enacted myself out of the church. I've been separated from God and from the church. And so I'm going to the church to be brought back into the church. That's the nature of penance. And so it's a renewal. It's a renewal of persevering grace. So it became natural to attach penance with the idea of persevering grace. Let's see theologically how this worked out, starting with baptism. And I'll read the Catechism of the Catholic Church. When we made our first profession of faith while receiving holy baptism that cleansed us, Here's what happened. The forgiveness we received then was so full and complete that there remained in us absolutely nothing left to efface. All sin is forgiven. Original sin is forgiven and offenses committed by our own will, nor was there left any penalty to suffer in order to expiate them. So I'm fully purified in my baptism by the work of Christ. It's full and it's complete. But notice I have to continue to live the Christian life. So yet the grace of baptism delivers no one from all the weaknesses of nature. On the contrary, we must still combat the movements of concupiscence, that downward tendency toward corruption, the way my will always seems to move from God, which it should be focused on, to lesser things, which it shouldn't be focused on, ultimately, that never cease leading us to evil. So concupiscence, that downward tendency, still has a pull on us, even after baptism. And the new life received in Christian initiation has not abolished the frailty and weakness of human nature. Forgiveness was complete. It was absolute at our baptism. But it didn't take away the frailty of human nature, nor the inclination to sin that tradition calls concupiscence, that downward tendency, which remains in the baptized such that with the help of grace in Christ, they may prove themselves in the struggle of the Christian life. We are putting to death the deeds of the body. We're pressing back against that downward tendency of concupiscence in the Christian life. That's the ongoing process of grace. So baptism gave us absolute forgiveness from sin, but it did not take away our sinful tendency. And so therefore, we might continue to sin and enact ourselves away from the grace of God. That then leads us to the doctrine of penance and that particular sacrament by which we're restored to our faith, restored to harmony with the church and brought back on track in our Christian life. Now we might ask here, why exactly is the church necessary for forgiveness? After all, it would seem that it's God that we've sinned against, and it's God that forgives sin. First, 
we must emphasize the priest offers the forgiveness of Christ. The priest is the representative offering the forgiveness of Christ. The priest himself does not forgive sins. Catechism is absolutely clear on this. Only God forgives sins, it says. All forgiveness ultimately comes from God. But all sin has a social dimension. We know that when we sin, we don't just harm God, we harm others as well. And therefore, it's fitting to confess before a representative of the social body that we've hurt. Now, who have we harmed specifically? Well, the church, because we as members of the church have enacted ourselves out of the church, and so therefore we've harmed other members. We've separated ourselves, and therefore other members of the church are harmed in that. So sin, before all else, is an offense against God, a rupture of communion with him. But at the same time, it damages, it damages communion with the church. For this reason, conversion entails both God's forgiveness and reconciliation with the church which are expressed and accomplished liturgically by the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. So here we have an opportunity to go and confess our sins to a representative of the church and therefore be brought back into the church. Another important qualification here, confession is for mortal sin. Christ instituted the sacrament of penance for all sinful members of his church, above all those who since baptism have fallen into grave mortal sin and thus have lost their baptismal grace and wounded ecclesial communion. So it's to them that the sacrament of penance offers a new possibility to convert and to recover the grace of justification. At this point, then, we have to discuss a distinction between mortal sin and venial sin. Now, Protestants often don't like that distinction, but I think that it's pretty obvious that such a distinction exists and could be articulated. So mortal sins have to do with grave matter. They're serious. They deal with full knowledge of the material. I know that I'm doing something bad and I deliberately decide to do it. On the other hand, venial sins are sins of a lesser matter and, well, I may not have fully consented to it, or maybe I didn't fully know that the action was sinful. Let's say that I come home irritable one night because things at work are bothering me, and so I come in, my wife makes a comment to me, and I reply with a snippy and disrespectful remark. I wasn't hardly thinking about her at all, and, and so I just said it. Now, that certainly is wrong. It's a sin. It ought to be confessed to her and to God. But that's a different kind of a thing than if I, with full deliberate knowledge and consent, decided to break our marriage vow and have an affair with someone else. That would be a different kind of a thing because it would break that bond of our marriage. That's basically what the church is getting at here. There's a distinction between certain kinds of sins that we know full well they're sin and we know they're serious and we deliberately decide to do them. And then sins of lesser matter like perhaps having a bad attitude. C.S. Lewis describes it with the image of sailboats trying to reach a destination. The sailboats are sailing together, heading in a destination, and then sometimes choppy seas might get one a little bit off course. It's able to bring itself back and pull itself into alignment to still go in the same direction. There are certain maneuvers, though, that would turn that sailboat off track and it would never reach its destination. And that's the kind of thing the church is getting at here. There are some sins that when I deliberately and with full knowledge choose them, I'm enacting myself out of the church. I'm doing something that I know has no place in the life of the church. I'm doing it intentionally. And so I'm moving away from the life of the church. Venial sins then, it's important to note, will not destroy the grace of the soul. But what a venial sin does, and here it's very serious, is it weakens a person's will. Over the course of time, if I have a habit of having bad attitude, and I let complaining go unchecked, sooner or later I'm going to be I'm going to make that a habit. 
and that habit is going to lead me distinctly away from the church. So venial sins can very easily reach to the level of mortal sins over the course of time. There seems to be scriptural evidence for this kind of distinction. John says all wrongdoing is sin, but there's a sin that is not deadly, and there's a sin that is deadly. Anyone who doesn't remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither, and people will gather them and throw them into a fire, and they'll be burned. There's something going on there that's more serious than the typical day-to-day -day sins that all of us will almost inevitably commit. And then Paul gives us a list, several places in the New Testament, of what he calls grave sins. Anyone who commits these sins will not enter the kingdom of God. So it's helpful to follow the teachings of the church here. I don't need to go to confession because of venial sins. Contrition remits venial sins. Contrition means myself feeling sorry about that before God. And contrition does much more than that. It obtains forgiveness of mortal sins as well, because ultimately God does the forgiving. As long as I make the commitment that I'm going to get things squared away with the church itself, and so I'm going to go to confession, I'm going to confess to a representative. As long as I have that intention, then that sin is forgiven. So it's not as if a person feels contrite about mortal sin, but dies in a car accident on the way to confession and therefore goes to hell. Rather, that person uh, is in fellowship with God. They had the intent of confessing. Confession to a priest is an essential part of penance for mortal sin. And for Catholics, it's important once a year. Every person is bound to confess mortal sin once a year. To leave it longer than that is negligent on the behalf of a person, and the church says you have to come to church at least once a year to confess your mortal sin. Now, without being strictly necessary, confession of everyday faults, that is, venial sins, is strongly recommended by the church. So it may be a very good thing for me to go to confession and confess venial sins because that helps build our habit. It forms our conscience. It fights against evil tendencies. It allows ourselves to be healed by Christ and allows us to progress in the life of the Spirit. So all of these good benefits come from consciously confessing my sins. This sacrament then brings us back into the life of the church. If we've committed mortal sin, it restores our relationship with the church. If we've committed venial sin, it renews and enlivens that relationship with the church. So there's a short background on the development of the sacramental system, its importance for believers in the life of the church, and we've seen how baptism attaches to provenient grace as a symbol of how God works before the person is even conscious of God's working, turns the will toward himself. And then we've seen how penance seems to go along with persevering grace, how in the process of living the Christian life, it's possible that I enact myself out of it through sin and need to be restored to it through the sacrament of penance. Now, why is that important? Well, First of all, we can see Augustine's model in action here. It's being developed in line with the sacramental practices that are growing in the church and becoming normative in the church. And so these two naturally work together. Provenient grace is completely operative, symbolized in baptism, where something happens without the baby's knowledge of it. But persevering grace is a different kind of a thing. And here we see that tension with Augustine, where one could get provenient grace, but one might lose persevering grace. So persevering grace is cooperative. I have to cooperate with it. I have to live out that life over the course of time. And, and so that persevering grace can be lost. And the sacrament of penance then gives a way for it to be restored. A second important point here is there's no salvation outside the church. And the church then functions as the means by which grace comes to the individual believer. It's not just me and God. There's a church here, and I have to deal with the church. I'm part of the church if I want salvation to work itself out in my life. And so the sacraments are that means by which I participate in the life of the church in an ongoing way. Finally, we remember here that for Augustine, justification is a process. It's to be made right before God, and that's a holistic process. 
and it's lived out always for Augustine and especially in the Middle Ages leading up to Aquinas through the sacramental life of the church. That's the way God has established that we live out that process of salvation and reach our justification in God.